Frank Milner usually felt like he was David facing Goliath. If it wasn't his competitors edging him out with the big purchasing companies, it was the ever-tightening government safety regulations. Every day he'd go into his little factory to manage operations and there always seemed to be a new hurdle for him to jump. Milner had no illusions of million dollar profits or holidays in Bermuda. The main things uppermost in his mind every day was his need to keep up the mortgage payments on the humble home him and his wife lived in and his responsibility to his hard-working employees. Sometimes he wished that the company was more profitable simply so that he and his wife Gertrude could afford to start a family, but lately he had begun to feel as though this David might actually stand a fighting chance against even the hardest Goliath. Just last week, several major breaks had happened to his company. First, the business had been granted an unexpected overdraft by the bank. Recently, Milner had been reassessing his factory's ageing equipment with his foreman, Bill Wehrer, and both men knew that their production and growth was doomed if they didn't upgrade soon, but the new overdraft wasn't necessarily going to be enough to cover the machinery they desperately needed. Then the second miracle happened. Out of the blue, a small rival company closed down. An auction of that firm's equipment was announced and Frank Milner was there, not only with renewed confidence and hope, but funds to draw on. Milner's bid was successful in the flash sale. Milner and his foreman were jubilant when they inspected their new equipment. Wearer, an expert machinist and engineer, couldn't believe the coup his boss had pulled off. The array of -of top-of-the-line machines were exactly what they needed to replace their worn-out plant. As an added bonus, Wehrer was thrilled to report to his boss that this already excellent equipment had been custom upgraded. Mr Milner, I've been an engineer and a machinist for 40 years and I've seen a lot of advances in my time, but after doing a few test runs of this new machinery, I'm frankly amazed. I can see how the adaptations have been made, but it's totally new and so pioneering that whoever did it is clearly a genius. I have a feeling that we're going to see at least a doubling of our productivity. The factory boss couldn't help but beam at this news. Bill, I think you've just made my year. All I can say is that someone up there seems to be smiling down on us and that we're going to run with this good fortune and make the most of it. He paused as he noticed a certain look on his foreman's face. What's on your mind, Bill? Well, sir, I'm chuffed with the new machines, but I'm also a little puzzled. I wasn't going to mention it, but there are several parts that have been incorporated into this equipment that I not only can't fathom, but I can't even gain access. I honestly can't work out their purpose. Here, let me show you. Wera led his employer over to the largest of the newly acquired machines and pointed a finger at a small section at about waist height. There was a round area, slightly raised from the surrounding metal sides. This circle was divided into sections radiating from a central point, each slice a different colour. There were no buttons or switches around this circular piece. See here, sir. I've tried probing it, but nothing moves or affects it. I didn't work too hard on investigating it because it doesn't seem to affect the operation of the machine. Indeed, for all I know, it helps the thing run better. That's all right, Bill. I see what you mean about it being a curious thing, but why should we tempt fate? Let's make good use of this equipment and not question the genie in the lamp. A few days later, what would have normally been the Milner's modest evening meal was turning into something of a celebration. And Frank... I'm so glad things are finally looking up at work. It's about time we had a break. Gertie, I really feel as though we're on the brink of a real success. Bill Wehrer assures me that the new machinery will double our output. 
that's going to fit perfectly with a new product line I've just invented. A totally original concept which has already been approved by the Safety Council. After I saw how our production setup had been so dramatically improved, I submitted my proposals to purchasing companies. This afternoon, I received an order from one of the biggest firms in England. I don't think they could resist when they saw the new product and the pricing and delivery quotes. The company says they want to place our product in their four major brands. Tomorrow, we're going to fast track production and we'll be shipping out within a week. Frank, it's like a miracle. As you know, my dear, I'm not really a superstitious man, but I've got a real sense that there's a guardian angel standing behind us. At Milner's factory, the newly acquired machinery hummed, whirred, and smoothly produced a multitude of new items. Conveyor belts carried the precious product to waiting packers and boxes, and trucks ferried their goods to their destination. Within a month, all ordered items had been received by the purchasing company, who then began their countrywide distribution and advertising campaigns. It all seemed to be a perfect example of business skill and hard work producing excellent results for everyone concerned. Once the orders had been filled, Milner announced to his staff that they would be given the next day off as paid leave for all their hard work. The boss reflected that he had never seen such an efficient operation in his factory, and one day off at the firm's expense was worth its weight in employee morale. As Milner left for the evening, he said goodbye to Bill. The foreman was staying behind to check all the machines were shut down and that all was in order for the next production shift. Once Bill had done his rounds and was satisfied that all the units were turned off, he retrieved his lunchbox, activated the security system, locked the rear door and departed. That night, moonlight cast a glow over the surfaces of the machines and boxes on the factory floor. An hour passed, then two hours, and the factory interior remained still and silent. If a mouse had scurried across the cement floor in search of some crumbs, and if it had run alongside one of the new machines, its attentions would have been drawn to the circular side panel about five feet up from the floor. But this segmented panel was now slowly flashing, with each section of the circle emitting a different colour light. A mouse may have found this display hypnotic, as would a human, had there been one there to see. But none were there to watch this strange performance, and this mysterious device was undetected for as long as it wished. It was a common tableau seen every day throughout England. It was a picture postcard that symbolised home. The morning sun casting its warm rays between curtains at the window, spotlighting the scene laid out near the kitchen. The cheery sound of birdsong heard outside in the yard. Unseen, but given away by the sounds of cooking, the mother prepares breakfast for her family. The sound of the front door closing as either the father leaving for work or arriving home from his night shift. A lime green light shade hangs over the Formica table arrayed with breakfast items, the morning newspaper, four bowls and spoons, a half empty toast rack, a butter dish, a teapot, four mugs, a box of breakfast cereal, a bottle of milk. But the traditional tableau was altered. A chair has fallen backwards and is lying on the floor. Just visible beneath the table, a small hand is outstretched. His fingers writhe until, after a few minutes, they are still. The mother appears at the kitchen door holding a plate. She looks down at the floor and her screams echo through the house. This chilling variation on a mundane theme is not confined to this one home. 
in house after house, apartments, schools, hospitals and other places. This shocking scenario is played out regardless of how bright the morning sun is or how cheerily the birds chirp. In one stroke, it seems as though the heart of England has been transfixed by an arrow. Corporal Bell, what are the latest reports? Police and emergency services keep reporting further deaths. The brigadier let no fear show on his face this time. If anything, his features hardened into a look, suggesting grim determination. What about the numbers of injured? Now it was Corporal Bell's turn to look worried. Sir, there have been no survivors. In every case, death has occurred. The brigadier's face was unreadable, but his words showed that his mind was racing to analyse the situation. This kind of uncanny disaster is exactly why UNIT was formed in the first place. We need to get to the bottom of this quickly. He picked up his telephone and dialed. Hello? Sullivan? Good. What have you found out from the autopsy report received so far? As he listened to his medical officer's response, his eyes glanced at a person entering the room, but his attention was called back to the phone. Suffocation, but cause unknown. You say tiny marks were found inside the throat, but no obstructions found anywhere in the body that would account for the suffocation. Strange. Very well, Sullivan. Let me know when you find out anything else. As he replaced the receiver, the brigadier looked up at Captain Mike Yates. Well, Yates, any news? Only more reports of death, sir. The casualties are recurring throughout the country. You asked me to go through the police reports to see if I could pinpoint any common factors. Apart from the majority of deceased being young, there didn't seem to be anything similar in the cases. We've already ruled out gas leakages or food poisoning. But I did note a few similarities in the deaths. All right, Yates, out with it. Well, sir, most of the deceased were found early in the day. Also, many of the bodies were lying close to where a breakfast table was set, mostly in homes, but in other places too. Of course, the investigators immediately took food and drink samples away for testing, but everything came back clean. But there was a common detail mentioned in several police reports that puzzled me, and I've been exploring it. Yates, in this situation, any little detail could mean the saving of countless lives. Of course, sir. Mike Yates opened a folder he was holding, extracted some sheets of paper, and laid them on the desk. These are enlarged photos from several of the crime scenes. If you look at these, sir, you should see the common detail I referred to. The brigadier looked carefully at each of the photos. As he put the last one down, he looked up at Yates with a puzzled expression. I'm not entirely sure what I'm seeing in these photos, Mike, but the small objects laying near the victims seem to be figurines of some kind. That's exactly what they are, sir. They initially attracted my attention because they were small and odd looking, and I thought that they might have been insects of some kind. But when I looked at the different ones in photos from across the country, I remembered seeing these before. Yates drew another sheet from his folder and gave it to the brigadier. This is a photo of the back of a cereal box. The head of unit studied the photo and read what was prominently written on the box displayed in the photo. Smith's Ricey Bran Wafers, the cereal that puts the vitamin B in breakfast, healthy nutrition for the, all the family. A kids, look for the free toy in each large box of ricey brown wafers and collect the whole series of creeps from the deeps. 
one plastic creep in every box and each one based on the strange real life critters living at the bottom of our deepest oceans. Vampire squid, gulper eels, angler fish, giant squid, fang tooth fish, giant tube worm, viper fish, giant spider crab and six gill shark. You'll want to collect every one of these deep sea monsters. The brigadier paused and looked up at Yates. And if I'm not mistaken, Mike, some of these creeps were visible on these death scene photos. Precisely, sir. I did a bit of research and that particular series of figures were also released in three other varieties of breakfast cereals put out by the same company. Very popular with kids. My nephew is crazy about them. Naturally, when I first suspected that there was something suspicious about the cereal toys, I called my sister and told her to carefully collect every one of them in the house and destroy them. But if it is the case that these little plastic things are the cause of so many deaths, it's going to be difficult to destroy them all. Both men were suddenly distracted by the opening of a door and the burly form of Sergeant John Benton rushing in. After a quick salute, Benton gave his report. Sir, uh, Captain Yates told me about the creepy little toys in the breakfast boxes and I've just had these reports from across London. The supermarkets are reporting that hundreds of breakfast cereal boxes on their shelves have burst open and plastic figures have popped out. At least that's what they think must have happened because the toys are just laying on supermarket floors and not moving at all. Thank you, Benton. I would never have imagined that this kind of commercial gimmick could be the heart of a natural disaster, but I think we're finally getting to the heart of the matter. The Brigadier paused. And this seems to come down to the plastic toys. Plastic? I wonder. Captain Yates, did you locate the company that manufactured these creeps figures? Mike Yates opened his document folder and looked through the papers within. He drew out a sheet and read from it. Synthoplast Limited, sir. A small firm in East London. I did a background check on the company and although they've been small scale for the last 10 years, they recently upgraded their equipment and boosted production. I've got their phone number here. He read out the number to the brigadier, who took up his telephone and dialed. When the call connected, he introduced himself and began to query the person at the other end. I wanted to inquire about... Pardon me? You say the company is currently closed? The brigadier was silent as he listened to the speaker. Oh, I see. I'm very sorry to hear it. We're investigating a possible connection between Synthoplast and the recent epidemic of strange deaths across the country. I believe your company recently acquired new machines for its operation. Uh, could I ask where that equipment came from? The unit leader listened and jotted down notes on the paper in front of him. His eyes suddenly darted up to look at Yates and Benton. Very well. Uh, thank you for the information. Uh, please accept my condolences. A uh, unit will be following up the police investigation there shortly. Goodbye. Yates and Benton were looking expectantly at the Brigadier. Well, that's it then. Synthoplast purchased their new equipment from the Pharrell Plastics Company. Mention of the name Pharrell and the word plastics prompted Yates and Benton to look at each other and then back at their commander. He was continuing. Apparently, it was this new machinery that enabled Synthoplast to produce these uh, creeps from the deeps figures. The factory is now closed because the manager, its operation manager and several workers have just died. The police are investigating, but I think I suspect who or what the culprits are. Captain Yates, 
You were in charge of disposing of the remaining Pharrell equipment after last time. How did some of it reach the market? I'm not sure how that could have happened, sir. We were careful to follow orders and see that everything was dismantled and destroyed. I can only guess that there were items that were held off-site and that the family sold them off without knowing the danger. Well, it's academic now. The Bugadale was lost in thought for a moment. Plastic. Sergeant Benton grimaced as he muttered. Serial killers. Despite announcements on radio and television and a mass recall of Smith's breakfast cereals, death continued throughout the country from suffocation. As before, medical examiners found no obstructions in the victim's airway, only minor trauma to the windpipes. Investigators at the scene were finding little clear plastic bags, like the ones that contained the creeps from the deeps figurines, near the deceased. These bags were torn open and emptied. Occasionally, police would find a creep on the floor, but more often than not, the small toys were absent or merely overlooked. It became increasingly evident that a creep was small enough to go undetected unless it was being specifically searched for. Sergeant Osgood, were you able to find that electronic contraption we used last time? It should have been archived in the storeroom. The brigadier was addressing his technical advisor as the unit troops loaded a vehicle in preparation for their departure for the Synthoplast factory. I think I have the device you asked for, sir. At least it looks complex enough to fit the description, and the inventory label was signed by Dr Shaw. To himself, the brigadier said, Good old Liz. She was always more organised than the rest of the scientific staff. To his sergeant, he said. All right, Osgood, that should do the trick. Let's see about putting a spanner in their works. An hour later, the brigadier's car and the unit lorry entered the parking lot of the Synthoplast factory. There was a single car already parked there. As the Brigadier and Mike Yates emerged from their vehicle, they observed a young man leaving the building and coming towards them. The man held out his hand to greet them as he approached, and the men introduced themselves. I'm Dan Smithers, and Mrs Milner asked me to look after the place after the, um, trouble. I was a packer for them. As you can see, there's now nothing happening here, and apart from me, the factory's been vacant since the police and ambulance left. I believe I spoke to you on the phone, Mr Smithers, said the brigadier. You'd make our job a lot easier if you'd be good enough to show us the production area. The brigadier turned to his men unloading apparatus from the truck. Sergeant Osgood, bring your equipment along with us. The unit men followed Smithers into the factory and the group crossed the foyer and headed towards a large doorway. Through this they saw the expanse of the factory filled with machinery, conveyor belts, numerous packing boxes and a forklift truck. Also visible were remnants of the police investigation with strands of crime scene tape at several points in the factory. As they moved into the large room, Sergeant Benton's attention was suddenly drawn to a large unsealed cardboard box sitting on the floor to one side. He went over to the box, opened its top flaps and peered in. He turned and addressed Dan Smithers. Excuse me for asking, sir, but do you have a rodent problem here? The brigadier had stopped in surprise at Benton's unexpected query but before he could politely reprimand him, Smithers answered, Oh no, sir. I never had rats, nor mice here. Why do you ask? I could have sworn that there was movement in this box as we came in here. The factory worker went over to where Benton stood by the box and looked inside. Then he reached in and withdrew a handful of small clear plastic bags. 
which he displayed for the group in his open palm. These were going to be our latest success. The ghost of a smile was erased by the look of sadness. Unfortunately, my boss and some of my workmates never lived to see the success. The rest of us don't even know what's going to happen to this place. Mike Yates strode across to the unhappy worker. Do you mind if I have a look at one of those, sir? Yates took one of the clear packets from Smithers and inspected it closely. He turned to the brigadier. Sir, that box looks to be full of undelivered creeps. Each one has been sealed in its own little bag, ready for inserting into cereal boxes. I recognise the one I have here. It's a vampire squid. The brigadier turned and addressed his sergeant. Benton, what was it you heard in that box? Well, sir, it was like something was rustling around in it, like a mouse. All heads suddenly swung around as Captain Yates shouted and threw the little plastic packet to the ground. Yates! exclaimed his commander, who was privately beginning to wonder if his two most trusted men were taking leave of their senses. What on earth is the matter? So, as I was holding it, it felt the thing inside the bag squirt. All eyes looked down at the little plastic vampire squid on the floor. It was motionless. The brigadier turned to Smithers. Were you able to tell us about anything strange happening while the factory was making these toys? The synthoplast employee rubbed his chin with a hand. Wow, sir, nothing particular happened that I can think of. Though, Mr. Ware, our foreman, rest his soul, had been spending a lot of time poking around one of the new machines. Whenever he wasn't overseeing operations, he was behind that big unit over there. He pointed towards a far corner where a large, shiny, rectangular piece of equipment stood with a black conveyor belt on the near side of the machine. Even though the power to the factory appliances had been turned off, the large device seemed to give off a faint glow. The brigadier pointed with his swagger stick at the machine. All right, Captain Yates, bring the men and the equipment and take a closer look at it. As they moved around to the far corner, they could see a circle of coloured lights flickering on the side of the machine facing the factory wall. Behind them on the floor, where it had been discarded, the little plastic vampire squid moved its tentacles and it gently started pressing against the plastic bag that encased it, as if seeking to break through its artificial cocoon. As the unit team faced the strange illuminated panel, the brigadier turned to their guide. Mr. Smithers, I thought all this equipment was turned off. Yes, sir. It has been since the police were here. I can't see how that light can be working. Very good. Osgood, use your contraption and see what you can do. I have a feeling that whatever ghost is in the machine is at the root of this trouble. The unit technician moved forward and placed his equipment on the cement floor beneath the flashing area. From his side bag, he extracted a roll of what looked like electrical cord and plugged one end into his apparatus. A small rod, rather like a microphone, attached to the other end of the cord, and the sergeant held this in one hand. He flicked a switch on the side of the device and power surged through its circuits. He stood up and moved forwards towards the machine holding out the rod and pointing it at the circular panel. As the group watched, they saw the lights begin to oscillate more quickly. As the group listened, they heard the hum of Osgood's electrical gizmo grow in strength and rise in pitch. In that moment, they didn't realize that they were witnessing a battle between two non-human technologies. Little did they know that the illuminated circular panel, a carbuncular parasite on the factory machine, was resisting an attack by a device designed specifically by a 
higher intelligence to interfere with its neurological pathways as the defender intensified its resistance to repel the force the attacker used the additional energy to increase its charge the result was inevitable there was an explosion and the unit men and smithers were flown to the floor acrid smoke bellowed from the factory machine and the coughing of the men continued for several minutes the brigadier was first on his feet and immediately took charge is everyone all right the other men became visible through the clearing smoke as they rose to their feet sergeant oscar retrieved his spectacles which had been blown from his face in the explosion and went to what remained of his portable equipment it was now just a smoldering pile of fused metal and plastic he looked up for lonely at the brigadier sorry sir the smoke dispersed and the unit leader was able to survey the side of the machine near him it may have been too much for your contraption sergeant but look at what it has been able to do before it gave up the ghost all eyes turned to the factory machine the side where the circular anomaly had been was now pierced by a black hole ringed by jagged metal teeth the brigadier continued I'll venture that we've removed the cause of the problem for good. Captain Yates, uh, call for more men from HQ and have every piece of this machinery in this factory completely dismantled and destroyed. Yes, sir. Mike Yates replied. His attention was momentarily drawn by the sound of someone blowing their nose nearby. It was a disheveled Mr. Smithers. Yates mused to the brigadier. I wonder what will happen to the factory's owners, family and the workers who we were all entirely innocent of wrongdoing here. The brigadier added, their only mistake was purchasing equipment which should have been melted down long ago. I'm sure the firm's insurance company will look after the family and employees, especially if a unit has a say in the matter. Yates took out his walkie-talkie to call for more men and Benton began issuing orders to the other men. As the brigadier and Smithers walked slowly back to the entrance, the factory worker addressed the unit man. What on earth was it that just blew up over there, sir? Well, it's just a bit complicated to explain, Mr. Smithers, but I think I would just say that you had a rather nasty gremlin in your works and that gremlin was not from earth. As they passed a box filled with creeps from the deeps, the brigadier went over and reached confidently inside. His hand came back filled with a bunch of bagged figures. These are now simply solid plastic and I reckon their kin across the country are the same. Just inanimate objects. To himself, the brigadier reflected. But there will still be a lot of mopping up to do. And no doubt I'll be called on for explanations. Captain Yates came up to them. Back up is on its way from HQ, sir. I couldn't have help overhearing what you just said about these toys now being just inanimate objects. That was all they were meant to be. If they hadn't been influenced by whatever thing was inside that machine, I'm sure they would have been a resounding success. The brigadier opened one of the bags in his hand and withdrew the figure within. It was a viper fish, made of bright pink plastic, with the creature's anatomy, including rows of long, sharp teeth depicted in the finest detail. Really, Mike? How could something this grotesque appeal to children? Yates took the figure from the brigadier and turned it over in his fingers, almost with a look of admiration. Only grotesque in our eyes, I think, because the animals living at the bottom of the scene remain so obscure. The creeps would have been a successful line because children are especially fascinated by more unfamiliar members of the animal kingdom. The brigadier humphed. 
Yes, you might be right. Yes, but I think there are healthier toys for boys and girls. Trains and dolls, for example. Plastic trains and dolls, sir? Replied Yates with a hint of a smile. 